thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, this new thing that uh, we call trapdoor hash functions, and as I'm gonna show really soon, it has lots of interesting applications. So let's start. Uh, and in order to give you some motivation, I'm gonna actually begin with the uh, application of uh, a trapdoor hash. So all of our applications, they fall in the following context. We have a public function, f, that takes two inputs, and we have uh, two parties, a receiver, Bob, with an input, x, and we have a sender, Alice, with an input, y. And the goal, essentially, is to let these two parties communicate, and at the end, we want that the receiver learns the output of, uh, of the function on, on the two inputs. Okay, so our focus uh, for this talk is going to be on protocols that consist only of two messages. So at first, the receiver sends a message, and then the uh, sender responds. Um, and our goal is going to be to minimize the communication complexity of such protocols, or in other words, to minimize the uh, length of these two messages. Good. So in an ideal world where Alice and Bob love and trust each other, we, we can construct uh, very simple protocols that have optimal uh, communication. But we're in crypto, so we're interested in a scenario where the parties do not uh, trust each other and each of them wants to keep his inputs uh, private. And we're going to consider the uh, semi-honest notion uh, of security. And the main question we we're going to ask is whether uh, protocols that guarantee security can be as efficient as protocols uh, from the uh, ideal world. So in other words, we're asking what's the uh, cost of security in terms of uh, communication in such a setting. Perfect. So in order to give a meaningful answer to this question, we have to distinct between uh, two different cases. And the first case is when the uh, sender's input is much larger than the, receiver, uh, than, the receiver's in, than the receiver's input. And a very common and useful example is oblivious transfer, where the sender has two long messages, say of uh, length n, and the receiver Bob wants to learn one of uh, these messages. And we want to achieve this while keeping Bob choice uh, uh, private against Alice. And we don't want to give any information to Bob about the other string, the string that he did not choose uh, to get. So if we do not need security, then we can let uh, Bob send his uh, uh, choice bit, x, and then uh, Alice can respond with the chosen string. So the communication here is dominated by the length of the second message, which is uh, n in this case. So our goal for uh, secure protocols is going to be to optimize the length of uh, the, the second message. Uh, and this means we want to optimize the download rate of a protocol, which we define as the ratio between the output length of the function, which is n in such functions, and the uh, uh, length of the second message of the uh, protocol we're analyzing. Cool, so again, uh, without security, we can get uh, uh, optimal download rate of exactly one. So now we ask whether we can match that in, uh, in, in secure protocols. And the bad news uh, is that we cannot, and this is not surprising. Um, and more specifically, we show that if lambda is our security parameter, then the length of the second message has to be larger by, uh, than n by at least uh, twice lambda. So the best we can hope for in some sense is download rate that at least approaches one when n grows larger and larger. And this is exactly what we get with a trapdoor hash. So let's see what we could do before trapdoor hash. So we could get a rate half oblivious transfer using generic assumptions. So these are protocols where the sender had to send at least two n bits. And the only way to get a higher rate was to use high rate homomorphic encryption schemes. And the only such encryption scheme that was known is the damgard jurek scheme which with security based on the DCR assumption. So from all standard assumptions other than the DCR assumption, the best we could do is rate half oblivious transfer. And the only exception to this statement is two very recent uh, uh, papers, the one uh, by uh, one by Gentry and Halevi, the other by Berkeski et al, where they show how to construct optimal rate uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes under the LWE uh, assumption. Good. So using trapdoor hash, we get the first optimal rate oblivious transfer protocols under the DDH QR LWE assumptions, and we also get a, a new construction from DCR with nicer properties compared to the damgard jurek uh, so more specifically, we get statistical sender privacy in such protocols, and we get receiver privacy, uh, which is computational under uh, these assumptions. Uh, and the sender uh, in such protocols, uh, uh, she sends uh, n plus uh, poly lambda uh, bits in the second message. Good, so we can further get protocols for more general functions, such as a batch uh, OT, batch OLE, and matrix vector, uh, uh, a matrix vector product. Perfect. 
So besides rate one OT being interesting by its own, it also has lots of powerful applications. Um, so the first application is in uh, private information retrieval. Using our uh, rate one uh, uh, oblivious transfer protocols, we get the first uh, protocols for single server peer that have both poly polylogarithmic communication and optimal download rate. So we get the first such construction from DDH, QR, and LWE. And in particular, we finally solve the uh, open question of constructing a peer with polylog communication from DDH or uh, QR. The second application can be seen as a generalization of the above, and here we get a morphic encryption scheme for branching program where the length of the ciphertext grows only with the length of the, of the branching program but is independent of its width. And both of these uh, applications are based on a, a transformation uh, from the work of Fischer and Paskin in 07. In the third application I'm going to mention, uh, we get uh, the first optimal rate uh, constructions for lossy trapdoor uh, functions from, uh, again, DDH, QR, and uh, LWE. Good. So the second scenario I'm going to consider for our, for our applications is going to be when the receiver input is actually the uh, largest input of the two. And a very generic example is when uh, Bob, the receiver, has a huge database of size n. And the sender Alice has a small RAM machine with running time much smaller than N. And the goal here is to let uh, Bob learn the output of M when we run it on, on his database X. And notice that because uh, the running time of M is uh, much smaller than N, then in particular when we run it uh, on the database X, then it looks at very few uh, locations uh, of the database. So again, we want to achieve this, uh, 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 this functionality uh, while keeping both M and X private. Um, and there are lots of real life applications for those of you who care. Um, so without security, again, we can let Alice just send the description of the machine M. And this is a very, uh, 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 and if, if we assume that M is small, then the communication here is independent of N and, and actually much smaller of N uh, than N. So our goal for secure protocols is going to uh, achieve communication that's somehow smaller than N. And this is already a, a non-trivial task when we restrict ourselves to protocols with uh, two messages only. And another thing I want to mention is that if we want security, then we need to work in a model where we assume that there's a common reference string that the two parties can access. Okay, so before uh, uh, having trapdoor hash, the only solution to this problem that uh, could get you a sublinear communication was to use laconic function evaluation, where you would get communication proportional only to the running time of, N, of M. And this is in some sense optimal up to uh, poly lambda factors. Uh, so laconic function evaluation would give you security, security under the LW assumption. And if uh, lattice-based uh, uh, security was not uh, good for you, then you could. Uh, then the, uh, another thing you could do is uh, you could use a laconic oblivious transfer, uh, which gave you uh, more or less the same communication complexity uh, and security based uh, on the DDH assumption. However, the problem with laconic OT was that it would not guarantee uh, the full notion of security, and in particular, uh, uh, the access pattern of the machine M is revealed to the receiver Bob. So using trapdoor hash, we get the f a first fully secure solution with uh, sublinear communication and security based on uh, number theoretic assumptions. So in particular, we get um, using a, something we call private laconic OT, we get a protocol with communication complex complexity proportional uh, to T times square root N under the DDH assumption. And if we want to use bilinear uh, groups with pairings, then we could reduce that to cube root of uh, N. And I'm already going to give you an open question, and it's whether we can close this gap between uh, uh, efficiency gap between uh, lattice-based solutions and solutions based on assumptions like uh, the DDH assumption. Okay, so now that you know uh, what are the applications of trapdoor hash, let's talk about uh, a trapdoor hash. And in order to define trapdoor hash, I'm going actually to begin with uh, trapdoor functions that we all know. And I'm going to take you back to the uh, two-party context. So trapdoor functions allow some party Bob to generate a pair of a key and a trapdoor. And then Bob can publish the key and in particular send, uh, send it to his friend Alice. And now Alice, given the key, can take her input x and evaluate some, uh, the, the, uh, the trapdoor function uh, given this key and get some image y. And the only one who can uh, take y and invert it back to x is Bob, who has the trapdoor. So using the key, you could evaluate the function, and using the trapdoor, you can uh, invert it. 
So tabular functions allow Bob to recover the entire pre-image of y, x. And information theoretically, if he wants to do that, then he will have to see uh, uh, information which is at least larger, uh, at least larger than x. So y has to be uh, at least as large as, as x here. However, in our, in our applications, we need something a bit different. It's enough for us that Bob learns only a small part of x. We don't need him to learn uh, the entire pre-image. But on the other hand, we want to minimize communication. And that's where trapdoor hash uh, are useful. So tabdoor hash functions allow Alice to compute a very small image of her input x, which we call the hash value of, a, of x, and we denote it by h. And now Bob wants to learn only a small part of x. So let's assume he wants to learn the ith bit of x. So information theoretically, he's going to need uh, something more than uh, the hash value. So the trapdoor part of trapdoor hash functions will allow Bob to generate, again, a key and a trapdoor. And he's going to publish the key and send it, and send it to Alice. And now given the key, Alice can compute a really small image uh, of her input x, which we call the hint. And now only Bob, who has the trapdoor, can use this hint and the hash value to recover xi. So again, Bob recovers only xi, but he needs much less information, which consists of the hint and the hash only. So the syntax of trapdoor hash consists of our algorithms, the hashing function that takes the input x and the randomness r, the key generation, which allows Bob to generate a key and a trapdoor. We have the hinting function and the decoding, which uh, uh, inverts the hash value and the hint uh, back to, uh, and, and, and recovers xi given the trapdoor. And we're going to require security for both parties. So uh, we want that uh, Alice's input x remains private, so the hash should not reveal any information about it. And on the other hand, we want that Bob's input i uh, uh, remains also private, so the key that he sends to Alice should not reveal any information about it. And our main efficiency goal here is, first, we want the hash to be small, and in particular, its size should be independent of n. And we also want that the hints are small. <coughs> and in, and uh, in other words, we want that the rate of the trapdoor hash is, is actually high, where we define the, ra the rate as the inverse of the length of the hint. And uh, to make some, some sense out of this rate definition, notice that Bob can generate multiple keys in order to uh, uh, recover multiple bits of the database. And uh, you can see that uh, the rate here, as we defined it, as, is asymptotically equal to the ratio between the information that uh, Bob recovers and the uh, length of the hints that Bob needs in order to recover this information. So the main technical uh, contribution of our paper is constructions for trapdoor hash with optimal rate under the DDH, QR, LWE, and DCR assumptions. So next, I'm going to show you the, the trapdoor hash construction uh, from uh, DDH. And I want to say that we use techniques that were used before to construct a, a schemes for IBE, laconic OT, and uh, trapdoor functions with very nice properties. And we're going to work over a, a multiplicative abelian group G of prime order P. And we're going to have a public generator of this group, which we are going to denote by small g. And let's recall the DDH assumption, which says that if we take two random integers a and b from zp, then g to the ab, it looks like a uniform group element, even given g to the a and g to the b. So uh, let's proceed to the construction. So again, Alice has an input x. And the first, uh, 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 and OK, so, so we, we're going to have public parameters for our con uh, construction. And these will be uh, 2n uniform group elements, which we are going to order in uh, a matrix of 2 over n uh, 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 uniform group elements. So again, these are the public parameters. And now let's define the hash function. So the way that Alice is going to compute uh, the hash is as follows. So Alice is going to go over uh, every column in, in the public matrix. And she's going to take the top uh, group element if the corresponding input bit is 0. And she's going to take the bottom group element if the corresponding bit is equal to 1. So she collects these n group elements. She multiplies them all and gets a, a hash value, which is essentially a group element here. So again, the hash value is defined as this product. And now she sends the hash to Bob. And like we said, uh, we, we, we're expecting this hash value to be uh, private. 
However, here we do not use randomness, so this, this health function, of course, cannot be private, but you, you'll have to believe me that uh, with a bit more effort, we can get statistical privacy for Alice. Okay, so now Bob wants to learn uh, the ith bit of the database. And for that, he's going to generate a pair of a trapdoor and a key. And the trapdoor is going to be just a uniform integer in ZP, which, are, which we're going to denote uh, by T here. And he's going to generate the key as follows. He's going to take the matrix from the public parameters, and he's going to raise every group element there to the power of T, the trapdoor. And then he's going to go to the bottom element at the ith column and multiply it by G. So the key looks like that. And we're going to denote uh, uh, the group elements there by the G tildes. And uh, under the DDH assumption, we can show that the G tildes, they look uh, like a uniform matrix, even given the public parameters. And therefore, uh, they hide the value of AI from Alice. So now I want to show you how Alice can compute a hint that will eventually let Bob recover XI. And the way she's going to do it is very similar to the way she computed the hash before, except now she's going to use the G, the G tildes rather than the uh, Gs. So again, she's going to uh, go over the matrix and take the corresponding gr uh, group element from every column. She's going to multiply everything and uh, get this uh, group element, uh, which is uh, the hint, E. So again, we define it as uh, this product. And uh, we can already analyze the rate of this construction. Uh, so again, we define the rate as the inverse of uh, uh, the length of the hint. And we know that if we want a, a security from DDH, then the length of the hint has to be proportional to the security parameters. So roughly speaking, the, uh, the, uh, the rate of uh, this construction is going to be one over lambda. Okay, so now uh, uh, Alice sends the hint to Bob. And all she means to show you is how Bob, given the hash, H, the hint, E, and the trapdoor can recover the value of XI. And I claim that all Bob has to do is to compare E to H to the T and H to the T times G. Uh, and, and Bob can uh, uh, learn the value of XI uh, uh, according to this comparison. So if E is equal to H to the T, Bob can uh, conclude that XI is zero and otherwise uh, he can learn that XI is actually one. And I'm going to convince you now why this is actually true. So let's assume for now that we define that G tilde as as the uh, 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 teeth power of the, group, uh, the, the, the public uh, group elements. So if the uh, G tildes are defined uh, this way, then it's easy to see that the hint is going to be equal to H to the T in all cases. Right? We just uh, multiply the uh, same group elements raised to the power of T. But in our construction, we do something a bit different. We actually multiply uh, G tilde I1 by a factor of G. And now notice that the hash value is still computed as before, but the hint E now depends on whether we use the, uh, the group element G tilde I0 or we use uh, G tilde I1 in our computation of the hint. And this depends, of course, on the ith bit of the database X. So notice that if XI is zero, then we don't, we're not gonna take this G factor, and if XI is one, we're gonna actually take it, and therefore the, uh, 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 the element E is going to be always equal to H to the T multiplied by G to the XI. I hope I convinced you. So this is our uh, trapdoor hash uh, construction from, the, from DDH. But I promised you a, an optimal rate construction. And this is clearly not an optimal rate construction because the rate here is one over lambda, like I said. So what I'm going to show you next, or at least explain in a high level, how to optimize the rate of uh, this construction uh, and get a rate one a trapdoor hash. Good. So. The, our goal essentially is to take this uh, uh, hint, which is a group element, and compress it to a single bit. If we do that, we get a rate one trapdoor hash. But to, to, to keep the uh, construction correct, we have to uh, be able to distinct between the compression of H to the T and the compression of H to the T times G, because otherwise Bob will not be able to make the uh, comparison and learn the value of XI. So we want some uh, uh, encoding to a single bit that will distinct between these two values. And the very natural candidate is to take the, the parity of the, district, the discrete log of the hint. Because notice that the discrete log of h to the t times g and h to the t, it always differs by one, and therefore their parity will always be different. However, if we could actually compute discrete log, we could also break the uh, security of the scheme. So this is uh, inefficient, obviously. 
So the alternative to, the, to this is to use uh, a very useful tool uh, called distributed discrete log, which was first uh, introduced by BGI in a totally different context. And distributed discrete log is actually an efficient algorithm, but it still satisfies the property we need. So what we essentially need is that if two group elements uh, have discrete uh, log that differs by, uh, one, uh, by one, then the, uh, their encoding is going to be different. So, so the encoding that we're going to uh, use is, is we ju we're just gonna take the parity of the distributed discrete log of, of our group element. And distributed discrete log, again, satisfies this property uh, and, will, uh, and uh, will give us this uh, inequality which we uh, need for, uh, for correctness. Okay, so with the time I have left, I'm just gonna uh, give you some open questions. So again, to conclude, we introduced this new primitive. It's very simple and uh, easy to realize using many uh, standard assumptions, but on the other hand, it's super powerful. We get lots of uh, new stuff we couldn't get before. And so we, we showed applications in, in, in two scenarios, and one can ask lots of uh, interesting, interesting questions. Um, um, and I think the uh, more important question we can ask is whether these techniques and this primitive can be used to get uh, uh, other stuff. Um, yes, thanks for listening. So we have time for a brief question, and uh, the next speaker, please uh, come uh, to the podium in the meantime. So if there are no questions from the audience, uh, I'll ask a question. So, um, you know, I'm fine with lattice assumptions, LWE, uh, but uh, so rate uh, uh, can be a critical issue in practice from an efficiency right. point of view. So uh, are these uh, techniques to reduce the rate uh, something that is potentially interesting uh, uh, also in terms of practical performance so, of these schemes? So we get communication that's like really, uh, uh, really tight, that really, uh so the uh, so we get rate one, but the uh, the extra uh, bunch of bits that we pay are, are actually they're, they're they're actually few in many of our constructions. I'm not sure I can say that the uh, computational uh, uh, complexity uh, uh, can match the practical com uh, requirements. But uh, speaking of like communication, the constructions are uh -huh. which is already good. But you think yeah. there is a potential for these techniques to lead also to something that people may want to, to um, run? It's, it's a good question. We'll one has to think about it. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.